Hi, I'm Rob Massa. I'm the Managing Director of Qualified Plan Advisors in Houston, Texas. I'm also known as the Retirement Pro, the 401k guru of the Foracle. I want to welcome you once again to my blog. Today, in this edition, I want to give you five ideas that you can use to mitigate possible failures in the ADP ACP test. Now, for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, here's a short version, and unfortunately, it's not that short. 4K plans and to a lesser extent 4.3b plans are subject to an annual discrimination test, and it's based on the contributions made to the plan. You see, back in the 1980s, the IRS decided that too much money was going into these plans for upper income individuals. So they developed a test that would tie what upper income individuals could contribute based on what the lower paid would put in. And it became known as the ADP ACP test, and no, it has nothing to do with ADP the payroll company. The ADP test is a test of the deferrals made to the plan from employee paychecks, while ACP testing is a test of employer matching contributions funded. Each test allows for a permitted disparity between the highly paid and non-highly paid employees that has three potential calculation methods. But in the interest of brevity, we'll keep it to one. Essentially, you add up all the contribution rates of the highly paid employees and put them in one bucket and then compare them to the contribution rates of the other non-highly paid employees in another bucket. If the disparity of what the high paid group put in is more than 2% higher than the lower paid group, the plan fails and needs to be remediated. Now, there are many plans that pass this test and many plans that are set up as safe harbor plans that automatically pass because of their high levels of employer matching or other contributions. But thanks to the pandemic last year, many plans stopped their matching contributions. So more plans are likely to be tested this year than in past years, and many more will fare than ever before. So what should you do if you fail? Well, I got five ideas on what you can do to help with a failed test. First, just check the data. Data errors and the mishandling of data happen all the time. Uh, always check your data that you submitted and the vendor's results before you do anything else. I've seen some scary things in my time, so be sure to double check your vendor's work and look at the data you submitted. Second is disaggregation. The law permits employers to separately test employees who are under age 21 and have less than one year of service with the employer relative to the general population. This is true no matter what your plan eligibility provision is. And it can really help because statistically speaking, the younger employees who have less time with the employer are more likely to opt out of the plan. And that can really hurt your testing results. Most TPAs and record keepers do this automatically, but you should still ask about this when you give test results. Third is called shifting. Now the concept of shifting is somewhat unique and is not as well understood by vendors as it probably should be. Essentially, if you're passing one side of the ADP or ACP test, but not the other, you may be able to shift some of the unused contributions, that 2% disparity we previously discussed to the other side of the test. Now you can pretty much always move ADP dollars or deferral dollars to the match test because salary deferral contributions are 100% vested at all times. But doing it the other way, moving matching disparity back to the ADP test is a little difficult because matching contributions that can do it have to be 100% vested. But since a lot of safe harbor 401k plans stopped their matching last year, it actually may represent an opportunity for these types of sponsors. Also, you could use a different compensation definition. If you've ever tried to read your plan document, you'll find a section called 414S compensation. Now, under the rules for compliance testing, a plan sponsor is allowed to use any reasonable definition of compensation or 414S comp to calculate your compliance testing. The only trick is that the definition used can't be discriminatory, but determining that is for another webinar. The point is, is that in theory, you can break out the various elements that make up your employee's compensation and use it differently. For example, you might be able to exclude bonuses or maybe overtime. This would then allow you to essentially change the denominator in your math for each employee so that the deferrals as a percentage of salary would increase or decrease based on the change in compensation. Finally, QNEX. If all else fails, you do have the option to make an additional employer-funded qualified and elective contribution to the plan. Now, this contribution goes to the lower paid. It must be 100% vested and laid out, and uh, sorry, it's calculated based on rules laid out by the federal government. However, one of the more recent rules now allows you to use plan forfeitures to help fund this QNEC, making QNEX really a much more viable option than it used to be because QNEX can be expensive. I'd like to thank you once again for visiting my blog. I hope you found this latest installment useful. If this is your first visit, please check out some of my other content on my YouTube channel and like it and share it too. If you need more information or assistance on any retirement plan related matter, click on the QR code here and check out my profile on LinkedIn or email me at rmessa at qualifiedplanadvisors.com. And as always, I'm wishing all of you a very successful retirement.
Thank you.